Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm so glad to be here with you all. Uh, just one month before my stepping down as the president of Telangana Photographic Study, but we have a very, very pleasant and a very cheerful gentleman, uh, an Indian photographer who practices his passion in Dubai, who are here today to speak to us and uh, recording in progress. Sorry. Oh. Sorry, sorry about that. So, introducing you to Mr. Mohammad Arpan Asif. He's from Bangalore. He's a pharmacist by profession and a photographer by passion. And he says he doesn't do any more commercial photography because it doesn't interest him anymore. He got too bored with it. And uh, I wish <laughs> people like me talk the other side around. And as he's sitting over there, as you can see on the wall behind him, the first thing that strikes your eye after his smile. Uh, are the numerous awards which are put up on the wall behind. Now, he refuses to speak about his awards. Uh, so he's compelled me to speak about his awards. So I will be saying these things. So I, 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 won't, uh, I won't be able to recollect all these on the top of my head. So I will be reading them out from here. So he has won many awards. He's been practicing for over three decades. He just told me that he started a photography club in Bangalore in his college in 1989 by the name Shatabai. Which, apparently, which was also the name of my studio in 1995. Um, he's won the Grand Prix in Serbia, FIAP Blueprint Badges for the Best Author in Salons, Treyenberg Gold Medal, Photo of the Year in Germany, Althani Gold Medal, Top Award in Lalitakala Academy, National Exhibitions in Karnataka and Gujarat, among 850 plus awards spread over 68 countries. And the latest distinction that he's had is that he is one of the fellows of the Royal Photographic Society, which is an absolute prestigious uh, recognition, as you all know about it. And uh, uh, Mr. Asif has also been bestowed the award for the Royal Photographic Society. He himself has started something known as the Askari Awards for promoting photography among the youth in Karnataka states, which is which is more than what we've been able to do so far. That's up to you, sir. He's currently the chapter organizer for Dubai chapter of the RPS and the country representative for Image Colleague Society International. He has lectured, judged international salons, and has been a columnist for various publications on the art of photography since the year 2009. He's been mentoring over 100 plus enthusiastic shutterbugs in Dubai, UAE, and in the region where he's now located. And uh, I am amazed that despite doing so many things, he still carries a smile on his face. So over to you, sir. And, uh, over to you completely. Uh, Ms. Asif, I, I may be turning off my video, so you will be the only person vis visible over here. Thank you, Arvind Chanji, for the very uh, you know, flattering kind of an introduction. I don't think I merit that much, as much as you said. Thank you very much. And <laughs> at the outset, let me thank the Telangana Photographic Society, formerly the Andhra Pradesh uh, Photographic Society, uh, my friend, Mr. Satya, uh, Sri Sarma, uh, of course, Arvind. And uh, I would like to pay my respects to all the great photographers of Andhra Pradesh, uh, since photography took birth in Andhra Pradesh. I had the unique uh, uh, honor to meet one of the greatest pioneers and the one who propagated photography most in the state of Andhra Pradesh, formerly Andhra Pradesh, uh, the late Sri N. Bhagwan Das, who was the president of the Federation of Indian Photography. Also, there was his predecessor, Mr. Bapi Raju, who was also the vice president of the Federation of Indian Photography. Apart from that, there have been great uh, services to photography from Andhra Pradesh uh, photographers in general. This is starting from Raja Triambak Raj Bahadur, Raja S.V. Jagnada, and then Mr. M. Hassan, H. Hassan, Mr. Shah Ali, whose uh, son I was fortunate to meet when he was in Dubai. Um, and then, uh, of course, I had a very good relationship with uh, Mr. the late Kusuma Prabhakar. In fact, uh, due to Facebook, I was able to maintain constant uh, contact with the late Kusuma Prabhakar, a person of great integrity and 
I had actually admired his photography and I had the unique distinction of having met him in Bangalore when he was there. Uh, I would also like to state that uh, the Andhra Pradesh um, um, Federation of Photographers, which uh, photographic societies, which actually took in its umbrella various societies in Andhra Pradesh. Uh, if you say the Guntur Camera Club, the Kakinada Camera Club, or per se the Andhra Pradesh Photographic Society, which were all un under the umbrella of the Federation for the Andhra Pradesh, which was headed uh, mainly by Sri uh, N. Bhagwan Das. In fact, when the first international salon of Andhra Pradesh was held, it was due to the efforts of Sri N. Bhagwan Das. In fact, he got the salon inaugurated by uh, the late Prime Minister uh, Srimati Indira Gandhi. So there has been great services in the field of uh, photography by the Andhra Pradesh uh, artist. And one who made the most impact as far as art is concerned is one of the veterans, uh, the late uh, uh, Rajan Babu, who actually um, propagated photography to that extent that a generation of photographers took to pictorial photography. Of course, I had the unique distinction of actually uh, seeing his prints when it reached Bangalore and when I was in the Youth Photographic Society and uh, what you call, we had some of the prints over there at that time. But the most important thing that uh, is being missed uh, is to honor uh, the great G.D. Naidu. Uh, this of course is uh, before uh, 1894 to 1974 because he was a pioneer. He was one of the greatest trendsetters who started uh, photography paper. I'm quite interested in photography paper because I'm a darkroom bug. I would uh, print in the analog era. A lot of my time was spent in the darkroom. So he made uh, a paper called Lippy paper. So this Lippy paper, in fact, I had seen a sample of it with uh, the late C. Raj Gopal in Bangalore and the late T. E. Dagger also. He showed me the Lippy paper. Now this uh, Lippy paper could not become Lippy cameras and other things uh, because photography was considered a luxury those days by the, by the government of the day, it was declared a luxury. So therefore he could not uh, make the lippy papers into lippy cameras or other kind of uh, accessories for photographers and contribute. Uh, and this is pre Hindu days. So I would like to pay my respects to all the Andhra Pradesh Photography Society on my behalf and the photographic fraternity of my state, Karnataka. Now I will share my screen, um, Arvind, and start my presentation. Do you see my screen? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Do, you do a wonderful job <laughs> coordinating this, uh, all the technical software over here. Uh, at the outset, let me state that um, I'm not going to talk too much on personal issues, but I want to reflect, as Arvin said, how I came into photography and my work and as such. Uh, but before that, I would like to show some kind of a memorabilia. Uh, if you can see the screen. Uh, Arvin, can you see this? Yes, we can. Uh, I'll just read it out. This is the Andhra Pradesh Federation of Photographers Five in One Salon. Uh, now, this, of course, is dated 1970. <laughs> uh, probably most of us were in school or something like that. So this uh, is a kind of a uh, kind of a memorabilia I have. And in those days, the cash prize here is 1,500. Quite a big amount for those times. So I have this in my position. This is the entry form for the internet. Uh, the actually a five in one salon circuit like. So as Arvind told me, I have to share my uh, experiences and inform how did I get into photography. So basically during my school days, I was sketching portraits. Uh, now this was actually a result of my bunking drill and sports. I was not so much into sports. I was more into extracurricular activities like uh, arts. Uh, so in order to bunk the sports and the morning drill, I would actually be in the library because I was a library squad. 
So I had the privilege of seeing a lot of magazines, a lot of books and book covers, autobiographies, but I would not read them. I would only see the pictures. So that's my first contact and fascination for the human face. Uh, and I studied in a school, quite a prestigious school of those times. Of course, it is still Baldwin Boys High School in Bangalore. I'm a very proud Baldwinian. Uh, every Friday, I wear a cap with the logo of uh, the Baldwin School. So I'm so fond of my school, so nostalgic about my school that I wear the logo of the school even at this age and every Friday whenever I'm doing photography. I got it uh, embroidered on my cap. So this school gave me the privilege to be in the library and the library was nothing ordinary. It was a fantastic collection. It had a fantastic collection of uh, Western magazines and books which were not so easily accessible those days. I'm talking about the 70s. And my, my kind of infatuation of, of, of connect with the face started then. So I gradually started making portraits. And of course, I should give a lot of credit to the school teachers, my art teacher, Mr. Murthy, and my principal, in fact who encouraged me in art and I was representing the school in many inter-school art competitions. I was a total failure in painting. I tried painting, but I was a failure. I couldn't uh, get the blend of colors as I wanted on the face and skin tones. Always a challenge. But I was successful in sketching. And later on the right, you see something called stippling. It's not that rare as such. Uh, using uh, Nataraj pencils, uh, I created portraits, the one on Professor Emil Shroff also you can see with dots. The entire picture is made out of dots. Of course, uh, there's no live person sitting in front of me to make the sketch. It's, you can see a picture reference also by Fairuz uh, Rangunwala. And I used to do it and I enjoyed the process. It gave me a lot of happiness. Uh, it gave me a lot of uh, peer following in many of my friends, uh, you know, I could show off that I was an artist. I won many prizes during the school because uh, many were into games in my class, but I was always into art. And some of the scientists and sketches that you see on the left are still in the colleges that I had studied. And Professor Emil Shrove is the founder of the pharmacy education in India. And this is uh, a framed portrait in the principal's chamber. It still is there, I suppose. So that's my first connect uh, with the drawing, sketching, and later on, uh, during my pre-universities uh, day, I was very much in, uh, interested in doing photography, but I had no guidance, I had no lead. I never, I did not know any photographers per se. So it was just curiosity. And Professor Emil Shrove, the with founder of the Pharmacy Education in India. Are, uh, and in fact, this it was is, the Olympus uh, trip frame if you find a camera. Uh, I tried uh, photography, um, black and white photography, and even the Orvo, not, um, it's not, or I'm not remembering the brand. So we, I tried some kind of um, uh, photography with those cameras. Sorry, the click one, click three. I think it was the click four that I used, black and white photography. Uh, those were my early recent stages where I tried to experiment with photography. Uh, then I thought if I have to uh, learn photography, I have to get the ambience of photography, let me start a club. Uh, but that didn't happen so easily. So I was on my own and I tried a lot of mm, pictures. For me, it was very easy to go into portraiture because I had a background in sketching. So mm, I took up portrait photography. And incidentally, Bangalore did not have any good portrait photographers or according to my knowledge, uh, there was not many who were doing portrait photography. Most of them were into nature photography. And if you are aware that uh, Bangalore is the center for nature photography, every second person you meet will talk about wildlife We'll talk about bird photography, or these days they will talk about macro nature photography. So everyone is infatuated with the nature and it's a good sign. And Bangalore has many sanctuaries and many locations where you can do a lot of uh, nature photography. Apart from that, many of the pioneers or leg legendary photographers of Bangalore are world-class nature photographers. So there was a good um, uh, foundation and base for uh, upcoming or those who are interested in nature photography to continue the nature because the groundwork has already been done. So the great personalities in uh, nature photography and for simple reason, everyone knows that uh, India won the World Cup in nature photography four times consecutively. All of you might be knowing how many times India won 
the cricket the international the cricket matches and all but you will not know that india won the world cup in photography four times consecutively and this record will not be even beaten by the cricketers i, <laughs> I think but the fact is that most of the photographers in the team that represented india were from bangalore or from south india but what i got from them with my interaction with all these legendary photographers from the late c rajgopal late b s sundaram late e anamantrao late t n a peruman uh, late b n s dio late t dagger late dr g thomas the you can say the pitama of photography in india man who started the federation of indian photography what did i learn from them i learned photographic temperament i i learned that you cannot just keep taking a camera and taking pictures you need to study the art it should be a, an approach quite serious it's just not it should not be just casual so you have to study art and i also learned a very important fact that the print is the final testament of photography and i hold it till today that you can only enjoy photography when you have a print but i know that it is economically not feasible but it is the best way forward and there's always a difference between a hobby and a passion you have to be serious so if i thought that it was i was a hobbyist i thought no that photography is a passion then i have to be very serious in it so there should be an in depth study and one has to also learn the science behind photography because photography is not just when you talk about art of photography it's a combination of art as well as science the basic foundation is science and then you have to shoot to the next level with art uh, the difference between individual photography and meeting someone else visualization or requirements as commercial photography there's always a difference and each has its own merits and values um, and of course the benefits sustenance in photography it's very very important that you maintain a momentum you cannot do photography in burst and then for some time you relax and have a temporary retirement or something like that you if you are passionate in photography you need to live it you should be a photographer by heart i mean like as they say you walk photography you talk photography you sleep photography you eat photography it's every time photography is in your blood the difference between taking and making a image nowadays in this world with uh, mobile phones uh, plenty everyone has a mobile phone of course i don't own a mobile phone uh, like everyone takes a picture because every mobile phone by default has a camera sometimes it has two cameras or three cameras my late father had three mobile phones in his pocket so <laughs> you can see that everyone takes pictures and that has uh, its own benefits for memory or for recording fine and i think it's very very useful uh, to take pictures in mobile phone for your own records but making a picture is different than taking a picture and this difference is very very important to be understood there should be a dedication towards the art of photography you are really passionate you should be dedicated you should love photography and when you are dedicated towards the art of photography the commercial instincts and other things and other trivialities don't come in you will be totally for you photography is everything and it could be if you are so dedicated it could be a lifelong pursuit <clears throat> the photographers that i interacted with i was very fortunate and i'm one of the, those creatures i should say who was there in the right time and even my contemporaries see that they missed the opportunity of not interacting with the legendary photographers of bangalore and these are great names the names that will be there recorded in the history of indian photography and it's so i mean uh, i was so privileged to be interacting with them that uh, my constant interaction help me to absorb these very very important attributes that i have just listed out in fact i was the typist for doc, the late dr g thomas and I had the privilege of signing uh, some of the letters on his behalf for the federation of indian photography i was too small then but still uh, i mean that's the greatness of the late dr g thomas uh, in fact uh, uh, this the place uh, where he was was the headquarters of the federation of indian photography 50 ram mandir road in bangalore basangudi it happens uh, that he was a neighbor uh, to my wife <laughs> i did not know then and then the late c raj gopal his house was like my second home sriniket and i was always there and my mother knew how to trace me so this was very very important uh, and i think uh, i had that mentality to interact uh, and uh, 
it was not that they were teaching me portrait photography. None of them were portraitists. If you know, know all these names, they were, they were great photographers in their own genre of photography. But what I absorbed from them are these attributes that I've listed. Then when I started to make images in a, on a serious note, um, uh, how do I do portraits? The easiest way is to photograph your mother, your brother, your sister, if, if they accept it. And uh, for me, I have also had some relatives and this is my mother's cousin sister's uh, uh, granddaughter. So Sabha, so I had uh, photographed her and this gave me a lot of recognition and name in the late eighties when I was participating in Indian salons and everyone knew about this picture. I retired this picture quite early because everyone identified this picture with me. And this was the first competition that it won was in the Sunday midday competition in uh, Bombay, in Mumbai. Now it's Mumbai, but those days it was Bombay. And uh, Mr. K.P. Jothadi from Mumbai was the judge and he was writing the column for this particular midday contest. And this, uh, though I didn't receive the four uh, Fuji film roles, those days we are in analog era. I just got this publication. The roles never reached me from Fuji, <laughs> but I was very, very happy to see my picture printed in this magazine. This is the first publication I had. Incidentally, when I bought the paper and I was cycling back, uh, there was rain and the paper got drenched and it got spoiled. So I had to go and get another copy. And the Mumbai publication was not easily accessible in Bangalore, but still I was able to get a copy of it. And uh, KP Jothadi's uh, comments on my picture really, I mean, encouraged me and motivated me into serious photography. So you can see that it, I'm just showing you a few, but it did really well in many of the international salons uh, that you participate, including your, uh, uh, what you see here is, I think, the Tenali Camera Club, then a camera club in Eluru, um, then in Hyderabad. Many, I mean, I used to participate a lot in salons, even in Andhra Pradesh, this, this picture did well. And there was one photographer, I don't remember his name, IVVS, he had many initials as such, he even requested a print of it. Now I'll just go into a little boring part, I hope you will be with me, so that I just try to touch on the very important aspect that you have to have an in-depth study, an in-depth knowledge about the, I mean, you should know what you're doing. What is a portrait and what's the functionality of a portrait? What constitutes a good portrait and what is the conceptualization and what makes a good portrait? Some of these parameters are very, very important to absorb, but I'm just going to make it very light, uh, though I'm not uh, conducting a tutorial as such. I have this book, what you see on the top, this is with me. And uh, in fact, uh, I received the best wedding gift I could ever think of. Now you will be surprised. The wedding gift was from uh, the late T. Dagger, who died at the ripe age of 90 odd years. And I was quite connected with him. In fact, I accidentally met him thinking that he would be my good portrait, but I did not realize at that moment when I was asking him, would you be ready to pose for me? I want to take your pictures. And once I reached his home, that's Dove's Nest in uh, Bangalore's Richardstown, I realized that accidentally I'm talking to the person who was the first president of the first ever photographic society in Bangalore in the, in the 1950s, uh, with the late T.E. Dagger. And he presented me this book. It was very, very nice to read this book and understand the various uh, um, uh, intricate issues about portraiture. And on my wedding day, a courier came to my place and I got um, a kind of a big packet. And I was about to go to the wedding uh, hall, but I was not interested to go to the wedding hall. I wanted to open the packet and see what is there. And my mother was quite uh, upset about it. But anyway, I said, no, I have to see this. She said, okay, I will open it. You see it, but you're not going to do anything. You will have to move. And then later on, you can have a look at it. But just to share with you, that was the kind of um, respect and connect with the great legendary photographers. It was four um, editions of the annual photography, the American annual photography, 1934, 1935, 1936, and 1937. You can, can believe it, it was those years, 1935, 36, 37. And it was quite thick book and that was the parcel. It was all gray, it was all brownish sepia color but that is the best wedding gift I got because I studied all those uh, articles mentioned. Of course, it might not be so relevant in the digital age, but it gave me a sense of the portrait. 
Now, as far as the origin and history of portraiture is concerned, many people say that it is the first subject ever in portraiture, but it is not the first, uh, uh, what you call subject. In fact, the human uh, element in a picture was accidental and all of you know the picture as such. Later on, you can make out that there was a person standing in the street, but uh, that's the first time a human was involved. But the first picture as such was just a window view from Le Gras in France by Joseph Nice. But later on, when the daguerreotypes and talbotypes were in, uh, a lot of interest was on the face and portrait. People would like to take their own pictures as such. And even if you go to museums in India, you will see many portraits of Maharajas and the royalty in the elite of India because it was, it was in their preview to get these pictures done. The common man, the poor man would not be able to get photographed in this way because it was something for the royalty. Um, so the daguerreotypes are very, very interesting. And here you see one of the examples that I have. And you can always uh, check on the vintages images and you can see a lot of daguerreotypes over there. But the first use of photography was for anthropometry. In the earlier days, this was actually for identification. Many people who were uh, involved with crime the first time and uh, there were multiple offenders. It was very difficult for uh, the police or the, the departments who were involved with vigilance to catch the criminals. So Alphonse Bertillon was the first person who used uh, the photographic medium as for anthropometry and for identification. Today we have the passport photographs and still continues from there. So this is the first use of photography. But later on, gradually, photography was used as a social document uh, uh, picture, apart from all the landscapes and other kind of genre that was being uh, practiced, uh, as a social document to highlight the apathy and the issues of migrant workers. And you all might be knowing Dorothea Lange's uh, picture, Migrant Mother. So you see that a lot of pictures were produced in order to get this uh, issue or the, the problems that the people were facing to the, to the concerned authorities. So it was used for so, so, uh, social work, but it had its purpose and it was very, very effective. Uh, little less is known about Lewis Hines' work. In fact, he in fact brought the, the images of children at work and he highlighted and because of his work, today child labor is banned all over the world actually. He, he actually, uh, what he call highlighted how very young children are uh, working in you know, textile mills in different mines and other places. And you can see those two pictures on there. It's from Lewis Hine. And this was so effective for the authorities and therefore child labor has been banned. So photography played an important role and in particular portraiture. It was also used uh, for psychoanalysis as you see, um, by Guillaume, and they try to, you know, this is a kind of a torture going on, seeing the kind of um, sensations a person has. Of course, this was very experimental. Um, Galton also used for various other kinds of things. And also we know about how um, family trees are, you know, presented with pictures as such. Various kind of processes were used. It was not so easy those days. And I think uh, with Scott Archer and others who tried to fix the plate with sodium thiosulfate, we were able to get uh, images printed. Otherwise, the print would not stay. And there was tin types and glass negatives. And later on, we got the silver gelatin, which was used much before the digital age. But what I was very interested in, uh, you know, the unique part is about Eugene Disdery. Now, the way he used uh, the portrait as such, he had many of the famous personalities visiting his studio. And what he would do is he would take the pictures and he would get a consent from them. Like even today, we have to get consent um, in any kind of a portrait competition. When you are presenting a person's face, you should have the consent, as we call it in general terms, model release. You should have that model release. Otherwise, the, the guy can easily take you to the courts. So he would get a kind of a signed uh, thing. And you can see the signature also there. He would take the pictures and he would make very small uh, prints the size that we used to have visiting cards, I think still visiting cards are used even in a digital age. I know that many of, the, of my friends, uh, photographer friends in the 80s, 90s, they would make uh, nice uh, visiting cards of, with their picture. For example, as a bird photographer, you would see a bird as such, or a tiger or a lion, 
and then the details, the house address or the phone number is such. Of course, I don't know whether it's still being continued. It has its purpose. And you can see the size, 2.5 inches into 4 inches, small thing. So what he did was he would take permission from these uh, personalities he photographed. And he would then make prints. Apart from giving them the pictures, he would make the small prints and he would distribute it and sell it to the population over there uh, in France. So the thing is that many became collectors of these and it was very unique the way it was with the signature and all. So how portrait was used is very fascinating. There were many artists that uh, you know propagated portraiture per se as a genre, as a unique genre within photography. Otherwise you would see mostly landscapes because photography is an offshoot of painting and it is the youngest fine art you can say. Um, one of the one which is the most famous as such is Yusuf Karsh uh, of Ottawa in Canada, of course, Armenian who migrated to Canada. And his portrait is an iconic portrait of Winston Churchill. And everyone knows the story of how this portrait was done. And in fact, it reflects the efforts of the portraitist. Of course, those were eight into 10 inches, uh, uh, what you call captures in the negative. Nadar was another unique uh, proponent who made portraiture very, very popular. But the man of all time, Alfred Stegis, he's known as the father of pictorial photography. He's the one who brought portraiture to the helm of affairs of photography per se, because he brought pictures, portraits, to the National Portrait Gallery, to some of the best museums and art galleries. He brought photographic portraits because otherwise photography was not considered art. So he is one who contributed a lot uh, therefore, he's known as the father of pictorial photography or the new generation of photographers as such. But the one we are all well aware of being in India is the work of Julia Margaret Cameron in Sri Lanka. Of course, British, but uh, who was resident in Sri Lanka for a long time. And her portraits had great emotion, great mood as such. Though it might not have the technical abilities that your present day digital cameras have. And incidentally, many of the, this present generation are so much infatuated with the technical details, all they want to do is make a map to get each and every pore, each and every pimple uh, registered when they miss the most important thing about a portrait and Julia Margaret Cameron's pictures are having a moody effect. They're not that sharp as you would expect now. In fact, some of the pictures are blurred because of the exposure times of those days and the technology at that time. But those pictures stayed. Today, we are talking about those photographs. And of course, everyone knows Henri Cartier-Bresson uh, as a person of street uh, uh, photography, but he did a lot of street portraiture, um, a very fascinating kind of work. Uh, there were many other proponents here for various reasons, portraiture was used to create a psychological relationship. You know, photography always has a kind of a change uh, frequently, but in that aspect, portraiture always is in transition. What is a good portrait? Uh, to define a good portrait would be very difficult because it's always in transition. Uh, I'm always quite fascinated with the work of Robert Mapplethorpe, of course, a very controversial man who died very young at age, but he actually revolutionized the, the, the approach in photography by making portraits in a very contemporary manner. Of course, his subjects are controversial. I will not go into that. But the way he thought about photography, how to use photography to show his stories, his interpretation is mind boggling. And of course, Philip Halsman. So you see the portraiture is not just to show a person smiling or something. There was a lot being done. And of course, in today's world, everyone knows Annie Lebowitz uh, for her picture. Uh, in all this, the one who made portraiture very, very contemporary, took away from the modern you know, took it to a modernistic kind of an approach is Richard Avenel. Everyone knows him as a fashion photographer and all that. But his portraits have a lot of thought process, have a lot of thinking in it. There is something much more that people see in his pictures. In the new social document that we are in this current age, compared to what we had in earlier times, uh, like the migrant mother pictures and all that, is Steve McCree's work. And everyone knows this picture. I don't have to say any, including Jimmy Nelson's the socio-cultural part of it, where the culture is also promoted in portraiture. So you have different types of portraiture being done. And in our own country, we have the late Jahangir and Unwala. Jain Unwala was one of the pioneers to start the Photographic Society of India in Mumbai. Dr. D. N. Road, 
great portraitist. Uh, his pictures are mind-boggling. He did something what uh, was in those days, something revolutionary as such. He got common men and took portraits. There was something on, and Vaman Thakre of Indore, Bhopal, Madhya Pradesh, uh, O.P. Sharma, um, uh, respected O.P. Sharma in Delhi, is also a great portraitist. He has taken some of the great portraits of some of the important national figures uh, and his pictures are also there in the stamps. And the late K.G. Maheshwari uh, from Mumbai, in fact, I had the privilege of communicating with him, of course, by letters. And I, actually, when I wrote a small uh, booklet on portraiture in 1991, I included uh, K.G. Maheshwari's uh, uh, article. Then we have T. Dagger, with whom I connected with, and Sam Bhatta. I have not met Sam Bhatta, but I came to know a lot about him from Dr. G. Thomas. So you have different types of portraits and the way you, within the portrait genre, the different kinds of specializations are there in this like indoor, outdoor, constructionist, environmental, candid, corporate, contemporary, in commercial aspects, you have different ways, corporate kind of photographs. Uh, what is my take here? So I will just try to share my work and also I will try to tell you what I think about my work as such. The first picture that I made was this picture. But this picture made me think a lot. It did fantastic, you know, it did very well all over India in every state. So then I stopped uh, sharing these pictures in the, in, in the national salons, basically because I started understanding that uh, the author of the picture, maybe I took the picture everything, but the person who printed this picture is one, I think you're all familiar with uh, Mr. B. Srinivasa from Bangalore, Bengaluru now. Uh, he's the one who prints and in fact, uh, he continues to encourage a generation of photographers, particularly in wildlife and nature photography, but he was printing in his place color prints. And he's the one who printed this picture. And when I saw the print, I was a little amazed with the quality because I have tried uh, color prints in various studios in Bangalore. They were awfully bad, very bad. Sometimes the color was not red itself. There was no different colors in uh, of course, they were all commercial studios, but here is a person who himself is an art uh, photographer, one of uh, the finest uh, wildlife photographers our country has produced. And he knows exactly what to do with colors and he made a fantastic print. And so I felt that the credit should be shared. It's 50% me and 50% uh, Mr. B. Srinivas. So this made me think a lot. Uh, then I thought, no. I should be the complete author. I should take the picture and I should process it and print it and it should be a one-man show. I, sh I should not share it. Art should be individual effort. So um, I tried uh, getting a second-hand uh, enlarger uh, from one of these very senior uh, photographers we have in Bangalore, Dr. S. Harinarayan, still active in photography, participation in salons. I was quite amazed recently. Um, and I bought from him, the second hand and larger, it was kept in YPS and uh, it was a paltry sum as such. And I started working on it. And because of my chemistry background, uh, I, I did specialization in pharmacology. My master's was in pharmacology, but uh, uh, anyone in pharmacology will have a very good knowledge of what, organic chemistry, inorganic chemistry, and chemistry in general. So um, I knew what was the role of each of those chemicals in the you know processing, uh, uh, what you call ingredients in that. So I knew what was metal, what was hydroquinone. You would get ready-made developers and ready-made uh, fixers as such, but I started to make my own. And I would like to share that uh, study is very important. To go into the depths of your art is very important. Uh, during my college days, um, I was uh, a member of the British Library in Bangalore and anyone who knows Bangalore will know about British Library, one of the finest libraries over there. Um, and there was one particular book, and that was the Bible for printing. It was printing. We don't call it word printing. We call it enlarging. The actual correct word, technical word is enlarging because you are enlarging a negative to a print. And that is Jacobson book. So it was called enlarging from Focal Press. And that book has a lot of formulas. It might be boring for anyone to read it, but I, I went through all the formulas and there was one particular formula called the new Winchester formula. It was actually the Winchester formula. I coined it as new Winchester formula because I manipulated the ingredient uh, volumes over there, the quantity over there. 
And that gave me a very good punch, a very good black as such, because I saw that many of them were struggling with black, good quality black and white prints. In today's age, also in digital, you don't get very good black and white uh, images because of some limitation uh, in the technology. It's more suitable for color. So in black and white printing, I went into the depths of this, uh, what you call the chemistry involved, and I would make my own formula. Uh, uh, and then I would print uh, on Saturday night in the bathroom. I didn't have an, uh, what you call a room for dark room work, which was in the toilet. So I would keep the enlarger in the toilet and would say that nobody's going to use the toilet for the whole night. And when the light would seep into through the wind ventilator, I would stop my work and then keep all the prints for drying. In fact, I have printed for some of the well-known photographers in Bangalore, but the prints were made in my bathroom, <laughs> just as a joke. So uh, the thing is that I studied, I experimented. Every Saturday night was an experimentation night. And I made these initial prints that you see, but gradually I uh, got hold of the printing process. And thanks to uh, Vimal Parmar, who is based in Mumbai, many of you might be knowing him. He is also very uh, popular in photography. Uh, he was the manager in Akfa in Bangalore, and he would uh, provide me with one particular paper, which was not popular in Bangalore. It was not uh, much in demand. It was chlorobromide paper because many people were using bromide. So I thought I will use chlorobromide for my portraits. And what you see is a chlorobromide uh, tonality, which is a little sepia towards brownish tones. A bromide, bromide gives you a blue-black tone, whereas a chlorobromide gives you a little sepia or brownish tone. For the portraits that I had my subjects of elderly people, it was very, very suitable. And I always want to be different. It's very, very important to have individualization and some kind of uniqueness to get uh, recognized as such. So I used the Sterling Akfa paper supplied by Akfa. And uh, Vimal Parmar was uh, very kind enough to bring this paper from Calcutta, Calcutta always. He said the studio people are not interested in the paper, but I'll bring. And I got a lot of free paper from him. So it was good for me to experiment as such. Paper was the costliest uh, ingredient in the whole process. The chemicals were not that uh, expensive uh, because I would sometimes steal some of the small chemicals. It's two milligram, four milligram from the lab in college. But uh, let me also highlight that this picture made a lot of difference to me. Uh, Sabah got me the recognition and everything. And I got disillusioned with the picture by saying that the credit is not always mine. P. Srinivasa is to be given a lot of credit for his quality printing, which I admit. And uh, of course, B. Srinivasa is, uh, is very, very good in uh, his knowledge about printing. So he also always encouraged me and he would divert some of the black and white orders to me. So I got a lot of practice in that process. So I'm grateful to him for that. But this picture now coming to the picture making itself was that in the beginning, I would take a lot of children, small children as such, but gradually my nerves were not in control. It was very difficult for me to get what I want because in child portraiture, you get what is presented to you, not what you pre-visualize as such. You cannot do that for a child. You cannot direct a child. You should leave them in their own world and then you should photograph it. That's the way I did a little, but gradually I understood that, no, I want to make something which is in my mind, something which I've already conceptualized. So here is a lady who, a South Indian, Tamilian lady who used to come and uh, come to our house in Bangalore and sell banana and groundnut. And my mother would talk to her in Tamil and very nice, sweet lady as such, but a typical lady with a big batu and all that. So I had some idea that I will use her as a subject and what I have conceived in my mind, I will try to replicate it. So what you see on the top is actually a sweater, the hand part that I put it as it looks like a cap. And then a shirt is placed on her shoulder. And then she's standing in the corridor. And the light is coming from the left. And she's a very smiling type of a personality. And I kept my camera. And I was using only Yashika. My first camera that I owned was a Yashika uh, SLR. Uh, that is called Super, uh, two, it was called FX2000, something like that. Yeah, Because it has got 1 by 2000 shutter speed, which is generally not used. But that was uh, the camera as such. Uh, so the picture was taken with her standing in the corridor and there's a light coming from the sunlight in the evening and there's a reflector and my mother is holding the reflector and I'm talking to her and I'm taking the picture. So when I was taking the picture, she's smiling, smiling as such. So I removed the batu also so to give her a different look. 
and she was smiling and i didn't want like that then i said that this picture is going to the police station then she got a little wild see first of all she's cooperating with me and then i i made a nasty remark but when i made the nasty remark her expression changed became a little wild and you know that this picture is called stubborn but uh, and i took the pictures and she didn't and i had only about two frames uh, opportunity to take the picture in the analog era uh, and i made my picture and this picture also did a lot of well i didn't wanted a smiling lady so that image actually uh, created a kind you know where i could make pictures of a particular style and individuality low key that means more black 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 monochrome prints of course i would obviously use the monochrome prints because uh, that is what i could afford rather than color yeah so in my photography i always believe in portraiture um, uh, that psychology plays an important role it's 50% psychology your choice of subject how you deal with the subject how you get the subject to be in sync with you to connect with you to emote uh with the camera as such to be less conscious of the camera but be more conscious about you and to relate to you in a in a beautiful manner so that this cooperation between the subject and the photographer results in an image which brings happiness to both the technicality is just 10% as i mentioned but i know that amateur photographers of the current era uh they might make technicality 90% and the remaining 10% is the other part so that actually you know Miss, I mean, everyone misses the point with that. For me, technicality is ten percent. Even if it is not a sharp picture, nothing to worry. But if it has got mood, if it has got emotion, if it has got a kind of a story, why not? And another important thing is the conceptualization. Okay, you have got a good subject. You know how to connect with the subject and everything. But what are you going to show in the picture? What is going to be your statement? This is very very important. It takes a lot of importance more than the technicality as such. So this is the way I relate portraiture per se. this is michael is a beggar he's a drunkard he was in a place which was those days very popular called shule police station many movies were shot in that police station the police station doesn't exist he was somewhere around there i picked him up there he is a homeless guy he's on the footpath such and uh, incidentally i noticed him when he was in front of the mosque uh, after friday prayers and i saw oh here he's showing his hand but i'm looking at his face and i look at him and he's thinking that Uh, i'm angry with him or what because i looked at his face i studied his face so that sometimes quite <laughs> startling so i said come come this side i'm not just going to give you money i'm going to do many more things <laughs> so i got uh, him to agree uh, to to pose for me and this incidentally this picture was taken in the vips hall i called some of my close friends to be with uh, me when i was taking the picture and i took this picture and i wanted a particular image and this guy is always smiling he's such a you know jovial person such poor persons the humanity in him is that he knows that he is going to get 20 rupees 20 rupees was big those days uh, in the late 80s and early 90s he is going to get 20 rupees and of course he is going to go for booze but that the thought that he is going to get 20 rupees for sure he doesn't have to spread his arms for uh, coins uh, itself is making him so happy but i wanted a particular look i don't want him to be happy as such in fact in this particular a uh, picture i would also like to explain that there should be a kind of uh, um a respect towards personal space how much you can uh, come to the border line of the personal space you should not trespass the personal space so here i'm going to give you an example that one of his mush it's not a digital age it's analog age one of the mush was crossing the uh lips so it would give me a big headache while printing and i had scissors uh in my bag so th there were witnesses i went <laughs> and uh took the scissor and cut off that particular mush which was coming crossing the lips so that means there is a kind of a good understanding between the subject and the author how much far you can go in personal space for example if it's a lady and if uh, in fact in commercial photography you will see that there is some kind of an understanding on personal space and that should be respected whatever it is um here is one uh, personality uh, i'm always fascinated with he is my geography teacher in uh, bolwins and he is also the scout master in uh, bolwins he taught me geography and i was a scout uh, and he was one of the famous uh, tap dancers of bangalore and it seems that he met baden powell also 
Uh, so here's the picture which was taken in his place, in his location. I don't bring people to my house or something like that. I'll try to take them in location or into a third party place, which is more convenient. And here it is in his place where he stays in uh, home for the aged area. And um, uh, when I took the picture, um, I mean, he was very, very conscious of uh, himself being photographed. So I had to give some time to him to settle down, settle down. And once uh, when I was talking to him and he was not responding, he had gone into his own world. He was thinking of something, was in a trance. And whatever I say is actually, he's not hearing it. He's in his own world. At that time, this picture was taken. I called it Soulful Endearment. And one, when it won uh, in the YPS uh, National Salon uh, Award, it got me the premier award. And incidentally, KG Maheshwari's pictures there right on top there. I, in fact, got the subject also to come for the exhibition. And then he understood uh, what I'm actually doing. This is very, very important for you to uh, make the subject believe what you're doing and be in sync. Uh, here's another uh, picture taken at my friend's place. Um, you can see it's all very basic, done kind of a setup for year, and a shawl was put. And this is the right to the picture, which was called Sequit, Sequestered Musings. In fact, uh, I was able to submit a panel of portraits for the ARPS in 1994. And uh, it was for the first time that an Indian was able to achieve in portraiture. And here's another picture. Of course, it is modeled with my fascination for uh, movies and Western film stars as such. I think you might relate this picture to someone I know that. So with a cigar in his hand. And this is actually a, a Muslim teacher for an English priest. He was teaching English for a, a priest, Christian priest as such. But uh, he appears as such. It's not that I gave him a cap or a suit. He's, he appears like that. But he wears a cap and a suit and he cycles. In those days, it would be looking uh, uh, odd as such. And here's a lady uh, who's again actually in the same street where Dr. G. Thomas' house was there. And uh, in fact, the first time when I made the pictures and made the prints, I brought it to Dr. G. Thomas and wanted to get his analysis and review. In fact, he predicted that the pictures will do well. Um, and again, as you see, low key. And here I wanted to show a typical Indian lady with a bindi and, you know, you know with, with the headdress and all that. Yeah. Here's again another picture strategist is a picture with a kind of a this was called spitfire here's a picture of an italian musician here i'm showing you the print actually you can understand the print is in that state whereas this is the digital copy of that so it's very difficult to get very good uh, scans of the print on the left is the late Ex-Chief Justice of India, Mr. Venkatramaya. I tried slides also, but it's a very difficult proposition. I didn't, must not have shot a lot of slides, but here's portraiture, which I tried with slides. Of course, quite very difficult because you are not able to manipulate anything once you've taken the picture. So you should be very precise with the exposure. Such This is just a copy from a catalog. And this later on when I went, I moved out from the very, very low key portraits and black and white because of the digital era. Then I started using color as a kind of a medium to make my portraits. And here's one of the first examples that I did on Afghans. Here's a picture I took in Rajasthan. Uh, this is in Kashmir. I was feeling very, very sad when I was taking this picture. There was a lot of emotion when you take a portrait of a small boy who's very hurt and you can see some marks on his face and he's running very high fever and still his father is smiling and cooperating. I felt very, very, and what all we can do is give money, but that doesn't actually solve the whole issue as such because it's very momentary. And they are in a boat uh, when this picture was taken. He is a farmer actually. This image I tried with strong lighting actually. Here's uh, one sister Teresa uh, in uh, one of the home for the age I had taken. And she told me, uh, son, why are you taking my picture? I am not beautiful. I said, uh, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. You are very beautiful. And this is the picture I took. And I told her, you please do your work. She was writing a register. There's a table in front and she's writing something. And she was busy in her work. I said, you please continue your work. I'll just take a picture. It was a handled shot. Of course, I didn't do any setup, natural lighting. And in between, when I said some comments, she turned towards me and that is when I clicked and I could get her high uh, pupils above the 
glasses and that's given at the picture. Here's again a picture taken in Rajasthan. This is a picture taken in Assam. Uh, I thought instead of taking the boys at the ground level, I have to use a different perspective, a little different, innovative as such. The boys themselves were quite surprised. I was standing on a dangling wooden uh, stool. Could have fallen down any time, but I was so much for the picture. <laughs> yes, something taken in Damascus. The boys were actually bullying me. They were all having fun with me, but I thought, yes, let them have fun. I will make a picture. And this is in the uh, old town of Damascus uh, uh, area. Such. This is in the old area of Cairo. Children were playing and having fun. So gradually my approach to portraiture changed from what I had started off with. This is kind of a transformation and I was experimenting more. We're trying to bring in more into the story content, uh, trying to bring in more naturalness and trying to show people as they are apart from my own approach of visualization. Here's uh, Roses Are Forever. Her name is Rose. So Roses Are Forever, I think you might remember the Titanic. She's not the lady from the Titanic, but she's a lady with uh, a lot of wrinkles and she was uh, uh, one of the Natural History Society members, mother as such. She passed away a few years ago. And uh, when I was taking the pictures, I was a little... Uh, you know, taken aback because she had some of her veins bleeding. And uh, if you can see here at this particular point, I did not uh, clone it out for simple reason. I wanted to retain it. The flies were trying to harvest the blood that was oozing out from some of the veins. So I said, stop it. I will not do any photography. She said, no, you have to do it. I said, no, my principle is you're getting hurt. Outdoor, there is a lot, a lot of flies. I'll keep the photography for some other day. And she said, you already delayed it for one month. You used to come, have tea with me and you go and you don't take pictures. I said, no, I wanted to get into a good sync with you so that you emote her. She said, yes, I'm for it now. But I said, no, I'm not for it because the flies are hurting you and it is not good. You might get infection because I'm from the healthcare field. I, I know better. I said, no, you're going to take it. And I said, what makes you think that I will take a picture? Because she said, you have to be professional. And I came to know at that time that as a young lady or a young girl, she was one of the top models in the UK. Uh, so I was privileged to photograph her. And therefore, this was the only few pictures that I made on that day. A little different angle as such rather than taking generally when you take a portrait you have to keep the camera at the height of the face uh, you, if you if you bring the camera a little higher in comparison to the face it would be disrespect to the author and i remember one of uh, the statements made by late dr g thomas that when he was judging there was a child picture and um, the angle of the picture was taken at a little height and when the other two judges said we should give an award, Dr. G. Thomas stood his ground and he said, no award for this picture. Then the other two who were much junior to him asked him why? Because the photographer is looking down upon the child. So you can understand what psychology is playing here. Because the camera is at height and, and the child is down. So he said, the, camp, the photographer is disrespecting the child by looking down upon. Because it's a solitary uh, subject. Um, but then having said that, uh, I mean, generally we keep the camera on the same axis perpendicular to the, uh, the face. Uh, the simple reason is that if you keep it a little higher and lower, you will get distortion, which is a fact of the optics. Um, so you might get uh, linear distortion. And if you come very close uh, to the face, you might get curvature distortion. But you can always experiment for some particular effect. So here the camera is much, much lower. And I want to emphasize the mustache of this personality. 
to show people just by face is fair enough and here is a contrast where i am trying to show people in their environment uh, which is called environmental portraiture what work they are doing what kind of profession they are involved what is their routine as such it gives more information story a little contemporary approach to portraiture not showing the full face itself just the eye using a wide angle lens and here you can see a good example of curvature distortion when i was going so close this uh, sadhu he must have felt uh, offended but of course <laughs> i'm going to reward him as such so he was cooperating and what i intended or visualized i got it and yes shivji joshi uh, when i met him in i said i am going to take some of your pictures so it will be honor as such so i experimented with the kind of uh, pictures uh when i took it and he was quite uh, appreciative about the pictures when i sent it to him because he is a thinking photographer i wanted to take his kind of different moods and i always like when i take pictures uh, to share the pictures uh, prints would always be good but when you are traveling it is not possible uh, you reward the picture, people depending on their uh, level in society and here i am showing the photographs make them happy make them feel thing because i always feel that when you are taking portraits that you are taking something from that person for your own enjoyment for your own art what is he getting there should be some kind of a give and take in this because sometimes you might not meet the person either uh, if it is a poor person you give him some reward money but don't give children money you can give them chocolates or something like that and then if they are a little above in society you can send them prints ask them their address and post them the prints uh, it's always very fascinating uh vimal parmar when he goes out on street and takes portraits he goes back again and gives prints to them that's a fantastic uh, gesture but sometimes this is not what they want they might want some money or something other things that some kind of an help as such um it creates a kind of a bond and happiness and here is a subject that i have taken uh, of course she is a distant relative and when i made the print and when i presented to her she was so happy and she is a non nigerian you can say she is in her 90s and uh, she is uh, not able to speak she is uh, deaf and dumb and uh, but very very independent and the kind of affection and love she gives is so good and she the way she posed in just a corridor you can see i am in the same corridor she is in the same corridor i just opened a window and the light streamed in and made her so beautiful as such and she wore a sari for me on that day and it's a fantastic uh, moment so a portrait i mean when people say and why i i take pictures and what is the pictures i would like to share is that first and foremost that portrait should create the subject should create a reaction in me it could be any kind of mood any kind of emotion it could be anything but there should be something it's not just a kind of uh, inanimate object it's an animate object it has got life there should be some kind of reasoning behind a portrait it should evoke a kind of that's therefore it's the first thing is that as a photographer when we do our portraits we need to be connected with the subject and you need to do a lot to get connected all the pictures that i have shown many of the pictures that i have shown in my conceptualized approach i have not met the picture person and immediately taken a portrait no i have not done i made friends with them i had tea with them i would visit them and gradually once i created a bond with them a connect with them only then i took the picture otherwise it's not going to work only then the same picture can connect with the others so if it is not connected with you how can you expect it to be connected with others here what i'm going to show you is a portrait um that i had taken uh second this is the result of that particular portrait and actually it is uh, it's called the truckman 3 uh, this is he's taking as you saw the truck it's quite a very big truck i don't know how many wheels it has got and he was going there and he came to the petrol station and i was uh, i saw him from the glass window the driver's area 
and I got very interested in him. So I went there, I made friends with him. I got into the vehicle. I'm sitting when I'm taking the video, I'm with him inside the, the huge truck as such. And I'm observing him, observing his nose, observing his features. I'm observing, trying to observe his facial features. Is he a good subject for me to take a picture? Will there be some reasoning for that effort? And I said that I'm going to take a picture. And I took the picture within the truck. This is the background of the truck. He's inside the truck, as I've shown you in the video. And then I have taken the picture. This picture does very well for me. But there is a kind of a sync with the guy. And, you know, and he, I made him quite happy with something. Though I, at that time, I did not know how well it would work. But it created for me at that moment a kind of a, an awe and kind of a sensation. And I was so happy that first, the portrait should make the author happy that he has done something. Whether it works out or not, that's something else. So as I say, a portrait session is a meeting of two minds. And there is a struggle. One tries to overpower the other. Sometimes the subject dictates too much from the author. And sometimes the, uh, the artist tries to dominate the subject. But I think there should be a kind of a good relationship on how the things are managed. There should not be some kind of a superiority. I see that many uh, portrait uh, photographers, they totally dominate the subject as such. Maybe possible in commercial photography as such. But in art photography, if you want the real, real emotion to come up, not stereotypical in, uh, you know, emotion. You need to give some space for the, uh, for the subject to emote. That's very, very important. That's why I say it's a meeting of two minds. And a portrait essentially represents a mo moment of truth. It's, it's just a moment that you have interacted. And the portrait stays much more than the author as well as the subject. I've written on the portraiture, the state of portraiture, and the kind of transition it is happening. So you cannot define portraiture in a particular era because it's always evolving. But what works for you is fair enough. You might use a color medium, a black and white medium. You might use digital imaging. You might use a lot of filtration and whatnot is fine. You see many of the portraits with a lot of filters. Sometimes they overdo it. And I see that many of the portraits done by uh, many in India particularly, and this has been... Uh, uh, commented by many of the well-known portrait photographers in the Western world, they are overtouching the portrait. Just like for commercial work, it is fair enough. But for artistic work, it looks too much artificial that uh, much more than the subject and the emotion, the touch-up is so much, it looks like plastic effects. And I think there is a, there is a, you know, a kind of a trend going on with workshops on portraiture. You have a model that everything is done by the workshop coordinate and everyone takes pictures as such. And then they do fantastic processing. So you get the plasticky effect, but it is losing the emotion. So this is one of the criticism that uh, I was exposed to about Indian uh, uh, portrait photographers per se in uh, salon photography. Uh, I have also given a lot of workshops on portraiture on, on, the, the, on the philosophy of portraiture that I believe in. Uh, now, I would like to give a little humble advice. I hope I have the time. Um, when you choose a subject, you choose it for based on your personal taste. What is interesting to me might not be interesting to another person. So you, you photograph what you like. Just because Tom, Dick and Harry is photographing a particular subject, you also have to photograph. That happens in workshops. Uh, that's not a good thing. Okay, for practice, for learning the ropes, it's fair enough. But uh, just because my friend is taking this particular picture of a, of a person, I will also have to take a picture of the person. So this uh, is a kind of a disease. So you have to ask yourself what you want to, what, what you like in this particular face. Are you really genuinely interested? Is there a conviction in you that you want to photograph this face? Do you have the reasoning? Then go ahead. Just blindly, you should not move forward. There are various reasons why um, taste is important. Why? you choose faces and such things. I, I, I always believe that everyone goes with a particular kind of taste that is in their DNA. We all grew, grew up with a particular fascination for certain faces. So they say beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Why do they say that? It's because of our own individuality and our own conviction and our taste. So what is beautiful to, for some might not be beautiful to you. So there might be some reasoning. And a face is such a kind of... Uh, God given feature that it could be in various uh, shapes. So you have a round face, you have a long face, square, oval, pier, diamond, triangle, and I've got kind of some more names. <laughs> the thing is that uh, 
you you go with your taste and a particular preference eyes eyes also are very very important in a portrait where do you focus you focus on the eyes and you all have some particular preferences for the eyes so it's okay i mean each one to their preferences and you choose your subject based on that uh, for example i was asked to photograph uh, a particular subject and i refused they asked me why i said no i will not be so um, <laughs> uh, uh, you know arrogant or um, impolite to say that i don't like the person's eyes i will not do that but i just said i have no time i will not do it because you need to have that conviction you need to be in sync and it should meet your taste so each one will have their own preferences i'm very particular about the eyes i'm very particular about the nose in certain noses when they i don't like to for take a picture so many people ask me what kind of nose do you like so noses can be very very different it could be greek nose it could be a nubian nose it could be a fleshy nose it could be a roman nose it could be arched nose or it could be a humpy nose so different different kind of noses are there so as you see the sketch here you can see that noses are a bit different shape of course i don't like the dravidian noses <laughs> with all respects uh, i like more of the greco roman uh, noses or we can call the aryan kind of uh, noses of course without any racial prejudices and i'll not go much into the lens because i see about the time but i will go into some basic features so that it would be some information at least what i believe in that when you are shooting uh, portraits you will obviously come to a question what is the best focal length around 100 mm is good now you'll ask me why basically because 100 mm gives you a good working space from the subject and it gives you proportion of the faces not much distorted if you go wide angle you will get a curvature distortion you will get very very you know um, you know chubby cheeks and uh, you know very what you call the forehead will be compressed the chin will be compressed so you should not go wide angle and also it would actually antagonize the subject so you have to have a good working distance you have to respect personal space so working around 100 is good to give you a kind of a lively facial proportion the shape uh, but generally in fashion photography or if if it is a if it is a girl if it is a young person you might like to create uh, a more flattering kind of a, a, a shape where you know you get more uh, compressed because as you increase the focal length the compression increases um flattening occurs and this is more flattering to the subject because all the pores and other blemishes all get hidden that's what fashion uh, photographers do so you see them going for 200 mm 300 mm lenses and taking fair enough but when you're taking elderly people when you're taking Uh, where you want to show the three dimensionality of the faces without any issue about showing only glamorous part or the beautiful part of it then i think around 100 mm is the better uh, option uh, even wide angle can be done but it is actually going to make some distortion uh, i will not go into the various uh, trivial things i think you all are well aware about it i'll just touch on some of the lighting part uh, just as some learning um i'm just going to show you five different light setups quickly uh with two uh, simple light sources uh, one is the main light obviously uh that lights up the subject another one is just to fill in the shadows because if the shadows are not filled up you will get too much of contrast and many things will be blacked out uh the position of the lights the intensity of the lights and the area the light spreads is very very important so lighting is very very important in portraiture otherwise you know it doesn't bring the subject to life you might have a fantastic subject choice you might have a subject which emotes well but if you don't have light then it's difficult because photography is writing with light and if you don't have light it doesn't work as a good photograph so i have used very unconventional systems i will not go into that it looks very odd that you can see that this picture and you have seen the result of this picture sequestered musings in my arps panel this was the most commented one um you see from the background it is still there is sunlight it is not yet night and i'm using two tungsten lights and one reflector such so it looks very odd i will not go into this setup but i will try to show in practice various light sources i always love natural sunlight rather than artificial light i've used very less of artificial light i have never used uh, flashes i never use uh, your elin chromes and brolin chromes i've never done that i'm a person who does not own a flash i have always believed in natural sunlight use the god given light and try to control it all the pictures that you have seen there is no extra lighting or no flashes or strobes in some there was artificial light and that is the tungsten light and sometimes used in daylight 
the best light is coming from the window or through the door diffuse light and then internally you have a reflector you're done with it you can make so that you can concentrate more on the emotion and uh, the characterization uh, the first uh, lighting which is the most common lighting is the rembrandt lighting you know the famous painter rembrandt here as you see on on the diagram you have the camera position here you have a main light here and then you have a fill in light here so the main light is quite strong and it gives you the the, the strong light over here and all the highlights whereas the the optional light here or the bounce light or a reflector is the easiest one that you can make is take the aluminum foil that you use to keep the food warm crush it and then spread it out on a cardboard paste it on a cardboard and that's your best uh, reflector don't keep it just as an aluminum sheet uh, crumple it so that it becomes soft as such so corrugated on a corrugated surface yeah and this particular lighting i'm going to show to you here this is a rembrandt lighting the light is coming from the right and on the left is the fill in light so depending on the position of the reflector you will be able to control the shadow intensity so what you get is a inverted triangle here so rembrandt used this and we i mean we have seen that it works and one of the most commonly used in old cinema movies you see this is the most common lighting used for the actors so you see based on the intensity that inverted triangle that is on the other side is seen uh, the next is the loop lighting where you see a shadow going on the other side so it's always you have to understand the photography is the play of light and shadow so how are you creating the three dimensionality by light and shadow if you have the light straight on front that means it's flat lighting and you don't have shadows so it will be like a map your art is two dimensional agreed it has got a length and a breadth it doesn't have a depth but you need to create the depth with lighting to at least indicate that there is depth with the use of lighting otherwise your art as a fact is on paper it is not three dimensional it's a two dimensional art pottery sculpture theater are all three dimensional art but you need to bring your two dimensional art to the three dimensional approach so how you are going to do is by having shadows if you don't have shadows then it becomes a weak picture i know that for glamour you don't want to have very strong shadows it look little uh, not comfortable but you still have to have shadows the intensity can be controlled so here you see there is a shadow but it is very gentle and it is not coming towards the lips in order to create the triangle but just moving away and this is called the loop lighting so here is the split lighting here half the face is lit the, actually the main light has gone towards the right so you see that half the face is lit half the face is in shadow again depending on the intensity you can play with it, depending on the age of the person for example so here is the split lighting that i am showing you so with one light the main light and here for your information the main light is the sunlight which is actually one third of the face the two third of the face is the reflector so not much expensive equipment and this is the side or rim profile this is very rarely used because you are trying to show only one eye and you are trying to show a character with this part for some elderly subjects or like thinkers artists authors this can work in your ms satyu your i tried side lighting dagir himself with side lighting as such frontal lighting or butterfly lighting where the shadow is like a butterfly uh, shape below the nose so you see this this part so again depending on the intensity you have a kind of a butterfly with wings up as butterfly light another example of frontal lighting so there is different types of lighting and depending on your taste and the character of the subject and your visualization you can use it then the next important thing is composition i have written a lot of articles on composition but many of the publications were not so much interested in people want to make masterpieces but they are not ready to learn the fundamentals here on the left you see that my shutterbugs the group that i mentor had to do a kind of an exercise where i gave them pieces of paper and they had to stick and create compositions so this is very very important in our art the study of art the study of composition which is the grammar of photography is very very important for you to first absorb before you do actually anything here i'm going to give you some tips when you are posing the subjects very very important how you pose the subjects better you get the subject to sit because if the subject is standing they are keeping on moving it will become very very difficult for you to control unless you are handled but if you are on a tripod it's the best way uh, in fact ann mary gripman when she was taking um, i'm not talking about julia margaret cameron ann mary gripman 
the Swedish photographer who was taking high key pictures in 70s and 80s, I think. She, in fact, was not next to the camera. She had a long cord. Of course, nowadays you have uh, cordless. Uh, she had a long cord and she would be next to the subject, her babies, Swedish babies with white, white dress uh, and blue eyes. And she would talk to them, try to get emotion. And as she found good expressions, she would click on the trigger and take the picture. She was nowhere near the camera. So it's very, very important for you. I mean, the way you make your subject uh, not conscious of the camera. Now, if you get your subject to pose with one shoulder closer to the camera, that's the best because I call it the ball and triangle. Many people laugh at it, like a ball and a triangle. So the ball is the head and the triangle is the body, which is not of that much importance unless there are props. Uh, if you have a ball and a rectangle, it looks very static. A ball and a triangle is more better. Uh, getting one shoulder towards the camera. And then also you have a little diagonal. It creates more dynamism. Uh, rule of thirds. Many people said rules in photography. Yes, I too agree that there should be no rules in art. Art should not have any rules. But this is not something, you know, just blindly done. Since man started painting on the caves in prehistoric times, they were, there's some kind of a tradition that has come. There's some kind of a thinking that has come come there's a lot of study that has come and when you talk about the rules of third there is some reasoning i don't like it to be called a rule of thirds but definitely it's a guidance and each and every camera today has the grid we call it in, in technical terms the grid yeah you put a live view and you see you have got a grid it helps you to compose and you can use it as a guidance so uh, keeping the eyes a little above is always good uh, closer to the upper quadrant here i'm showing you that if you have the eyes too much up and you have too much of the base, it, it actually is wasted volume on the frame. Whereas uh, if you have an adequate base, it looks more, uh, you know, balanced. So it depends. Or if you have very less base, it looks as though the guy is up to his neck. So you have to think about how much of the ball and how much of the triangle will give you a good balance in composition. And always try to keep the eye above the midpoint. If you have it lower, then this automatically you will see that the portrait suffers. So if you see in the center with the eyes a little above the midline, it's, uh, it's an easy reference for a good composition. I've always talked about the eye and the catch light as such. It becomes very interesting as such. If you don't have that catch light that you get on the eye, uh, it, it loses a little impact. I'm not saying that it has to have, but it adds life to the, to the portrait, that catch light, or that you see a shining uh, highlight in the pupil. So here you have a pupil exactly in the center or you have a pupil on top. So you can have pupils in different ways and the shape of that catch light, the shape of the catch light can be square depending on the light source. If you have a window, obviously it will come as square. And if you have a, a, a rounded source, you will get a wrong. Even in bird photography and animal photography, they want catch lights because it creates life in the subject. There should be that shiny kind of a, a, a highlight in the eyes. In uh, I know in analog era, they, they used to sometimes uh, chip out the <laughs> emulsion. <laughs> uh, and in digital, it can be easily done, not a big issue. And it comes with different shapes. Uh, cropping, this is also very important. In digital age, you have more advantages compared to analog. Here you can see that the great uh, portrait of Picasso by Newman, uh, even including me, I never knew that it was so much crop. Actually, when uh, Newman took it, uh, he didn't take the way we see the portrait as. On the left, you can see the actual portrait. So you can see how he has cropped and printed and shown this part. So you have the freedom to, sh to crop. And in fact, when we are on location and taking the picture, we are cropping, right? We see the subject and we see all the external areas, but we crop. But it is always better to crop on location than to crop on the uh, on the, while processing because you will lose a lot of uh, pixels and your high megapixel camera will turn out to become a very ordinary camera. <laughs> you are paid for a lot for it. So uh, take care when you are uh, on location to compose rather than to use only about 25% or 30% as in this case. And that was analog era. Um, it's very, very important uh, uh, to understand uh, that uh, exposure about your work is very, very important. You cannot just take pictures and keep it. There are many people I know who might be uh, or, um, you know, strongly against salon photography or something. So then how do you present it to the public? Social media, fair enough. Uh, Facebook, Instagram, it's of course, uh, it's, it's cheap. 
uh, all you have to do is have an account and you can share your work but it is not the right platform in fact uh, when earlier days when i thought okay facebook i'll put put some pictures and share it with someone one of my friends said uh, he liked the picture and said wonderful then when i met him i said you really like my picture what did you like in my picture he said your picture did not download but i already made my comment so that's the kind of thing in social media is because they love you all your facebook friends are people who love you and like you and they're not bothered about your photography or what uh, your progress is so they will always like and say your pictures are wonderful even without properly seeing it so i i, I believe in my what you call journey uh, salon photography is one of the um, avenues for showcasing your work and i'm not saying that you will get 100% justice but it's one of the pre preferred ways otherwise you should have an exhibition and when you will have an exhibition the cost factor for an exhibition and how do you know where you stand in photography to have an exhibition it becomes a little difficult proposition there are many challenges as such the economics involved so salon photography is a little cheaper it is feasible and i always encourage my uh, shishus as i call them the shutter bugs to participate in salons and try out the pictures at least it will motivate them push them into serious photography i have written a lot on um photography as such so basically it is uh, you need to visualize plan and you know i've even demonstrated different kinds of portraits that can be done um some of the pictures i've seen i always uh, maintain that life is easy now the majority have let the camera become master so i think you need to take control and uh, ensure that you are the master not a slave i'll go fast into some landscapes so that people don't think i just take portraits of course in recent times i've done a lot of landscape work of course this is from uh, satya's favorite place uh, the himalayas ladda this is the lake the warm colors the cool colors in landscape something weird thing but i am a person always tending towards the monochrome medium because it gives me a feeling of uh, aesthetics i was just waiting for another complimentary element and then i got this cloud for the same picture it's a fantastic place the himalayas to do landscape photography is awesome some landscapes in color the autumn hues are something very very fascinating i'm always interested in those colors in autumn but then again in color i always feel that the beauty of the place is overpowering the photography as such so sometimes people when they see the picture they say oh wow fantastic place where is it we also would like to travel so what about the photography so the beauty of the place will overpower the artist as such so therefore uh, my inclination is towards the monochrome and i have working i have been working on my project uh, in black and white uh, the dunes first i started on color then one of the awards that i got for a particular picture um, that is the rhythm of the dunes which did not do well in india in fact it was rejected by some of my own friends uh, who were judges in various salons it's okay uh, probably they didn't understand the picture but it did a lot for me and it actually encouraged and uh, pushed me into uh, black and white landscapes and i started understanding landscapes and seeing form 
shape, texture. And gradually I made a panel uh, for the fellowship. And these are some of the pictures that were part of the fellowship panel. I thought of making it different by using the square format. And this was a little difficult. And the category that I applied for is landscapes. It's a new category and very challenging where landscapes are generally considered in color. Very hardly anyone does in black and white. Or of course, there's, it can be in black and white. But uh, land as such, uh, as a fact, is in color. Like nature, if you show nature in black and white, it is a wrong interpretation of nature because the nature that we see is in color. So color is the truth, is the fact. It was quite a challenging thing to show that my intent was to show uh, something much more beyond the landscape. So many people would think as fine art or conceptualization or abstract, but there should be, uh, I mean, it was a little uh, adventurous to go into this particular approach in square format and black and white and I'm not showing you the entire land. The, the sensuality of the land is unbelievable sometimes if you think about it. And I always believe in the print. As I said, that I'm a person who was always involved with the darkroom and printing. So even in the digital age, I feel that we are missing out on a very important aspect of our photography. We need to print our pictures. And I know that many of you will say conservation, uh, don't waste uh, paper and all that. So you will waste on 101 odd things, useless things. But why not for something that is meaningful, that will give you happiness and you will treasure it. So I would not consider it a waste. Uh, so it's like, you know, you, you leave the elephant out and catch the tail. So I believe that, uh, and thankfully there are some print salons going on. I participate in these kind of salons. I make my own prints and it gives a lot of happiness. So the, uh, uh, the FRPS panel was printed by myself, mounted here, as you see one of the pictures. Now, very important giving back to the art. Fair enough. I did a lot of art. So uh, my mother, late mother, Sharo Kaskari, she in the early 90s, uh, 96, something like that. She told me, okay, you did so much of art. You got so much of name, fame in our country. What did you give back? So this was a question. I didn't have an answer. So I thought about it. And then I started the Askari Awards. It's dedicated in her name. And I have a fantastic team uh, who are responsible for conducting this. It's not me only, though I just uh, started it. It's 1997 that we started the Askari Awards. Um, there's a dedicated website for it. And uh, I have a fantastic team of Professor M.S. Harish, who was my pharmacology teacher, professor. And of course, Ed Satish, whom you all know, uh, he's the convener of the Askari Awards. Uh, Mr. K.S. Rajaram from Youth Photographic Society, A.S. Prakash, and Murli Santanam, uh, who's great uh, in all this IT issues, as well as a good photographer. So with this uh, dedicated team, uh, we have been conducting this uh, Askari Award since 1997. And there's a tribute to the, to the masters here. So if you scroll down on this particular part, you will see some small uh, snippets on the, the great legendary photographers of uh, Bangalore. Then it's my interest to create a community of like-minded photo artists. Now you will ask me, I mean, it's also giving back, but also it creates a kind of an ambience. It also helps me to keep the momentum on and in my school and college days, of course, I had some exhibitions, as you can see, in benches, I would put up my prints and call the students of the pharmacy, medicine, dental to come and have a look at my prints after college hours. And then I started the Shutterbugs in uh, the college where I studied and did my master's in pharmacology. The principal there, uh, Dr. Tampi, supported me as such. And the legendary photographers of Bangalore including late C. Raj Gopal, B. S. Sundaram, uh, late T. N. Perumal, late E. Hanumantarao, they all supported me and we had even conducted All India Salons. We conducted, I think, three All India Salons. But as you know that in a college, it's always a floating population. So everyone doesn't stay. They all, many of my contemporaries, my uh, classmates, they all have uh, migrated to the US or are very busy with their own professions. So it's 
uh, been a difficult thing to maintain the continuity. So it has wound up in Government College of Pharmacy, Bangalore. In fact, uh, the photographer on the left is from your state, Andhra Pradesh. I'm sure you know him. Then comes Shutterbug's Creative Forum. It's not just Shutterbug, Shutterbug's Creative Forum, which I started here in Dubai. It is on the on the format of a group. It is not like a society or a photographic organization or a photo walk or a club. Uh, I thought, no, I will make it a little different. It should be on the basis of a group where you have a guru and shishu relationship where I'm actually teaching and trying to mentor and trying to guide those who are not photographers. So I don't take anyone who knows photography. When anyone says, I know photography, then my doors are closed. So I take raw people, sometimes housewife, children. Sometimes people have come to me without owning a camera. They all had a mobile phone. So you can understand they're not serious photographers, but they have an interest and desire to do something in life and to have kind of a hobby. But that hobby becomes very serious, passionate, and they become internationally uh, acclaimed photographers. So in 100 plus that Arvin mentioned, I have 50 uh, photo, uh, members who have achieved international distinctions. Uh, this is a very vibrant group of people from various uh, places, including Andhra Pradesh, uh, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, uh, Bombay, Calcutta, Delhi, and our neighboring countries, including uh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, uh, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and some from Colombia, I had and two, three from UK. Uh, and you know, it's quite a good mix. And we all come there and it is uh, photography that unifies us. Uh, there is nothing, uh, we don't bring any kind of a, a package of our backgrounds. So, I mean, it is not allowed. So you come, you do your photography and then enjoy your photography, share and progress in photography. And it is quite rigorous learning. Some might not like the process that I implement, but it has helped them to become good quality photographers. I go into the basics and all these are novices. Nobody came as photographers to me, but now they are quite serious photographers. They own good cameras and uh, they are very, very passionate. There are kids also and I, I love teaching kids because uh, it's a good way to start very early in school days. Uh, in fact, I could not own a camera when I was in school. It was much beyond my <laughs> capabilities. Uh, but nowadays, everything is at hand and uh, people, young children can even own cameras and SLR camera because they could not even touch an SLR camera in those days. Um, even with a TLR, uh, Yashika Mat 120 TLR, which is a borrowed one, I had to be very, very careful because it was owned by someone else. But nowadays, the kids own their own cameras and they take pictures. They Actually, first they come with their mobile phones. So gradually, I motivate them and they take into serious photography. Some of the kids have really done well, but they always have a challenge because of the balance between studies and photography. But I always feel that they can manage the time and they can definitely do good photography. As I said, I always maintain it should be printed. There should be an exhibition. And that is wonderful to see when the works are exhibited. They've also got many international distinctions um, from the FIAP, from the RPS, from other organizations, from the Photographic Society of America. And most of them are quite serious. And if they're not serious, they are suspended or terminated from shutterbugs. Uh, important, they motivate me also. You know, I mean, they give their love to me. They give their respects. And I see there's an earnest desire to improve in their photography. And that encourages me more and more. And I give them my time. And in fact, uh, we have also conducted our first international salon. We are going to conduct two more international salons in the future. Uh, and of course, uh, there are not many, uh, not no financials involved in that because uh, I want them to concentrate on the photography and they get the possibilities, those who have come to a particular level to jury the international salons and about uh, a bunch, about 10 to 15 of them have got this opportunity. And I would like to see more of them getting these opportunities to jury and get that experience because when you start uh, image analysis and critical analysis, your knowledge improves, your photography also simultaneously improves. We have a dedicated website for Shutterbugs. I'm just going to show you a last clip to... I'm sure you, many will not remove the cameras. Uh,
what I've learned in 30 years of passionate photography, I believe that the foundation of photography is most important. In the sense, basic principles, technicality, certain compositional values, if understood, studied, and analyzed, can help enhance an enthusiast photography. The amateur is always lost, believing that it's the equipment that does the trick of making good pictures. So most of the amateurs that I see are into a buying spree. They believe that the latest model of cameras available in the market helps them to make excellent pictures. They think it's the camera that makes the picture. But unfortunately, they are often, they, they arrive at a dead end and are frustrated. It is these individuals to whom my mentorship is available in the sense that I provide them the guidance and try to make them realize that the art of photography is to make an image, not to take an image. the picture uh, created at that particular moment when you saw that the wind was blowing, the sand was creating havoc and uh, it's, <laughs> it's quite difficult to remove your uh, lens cap at that time because it will scratch the surface. But I was more interested in making the picture than considering my camera is jewelry or trying to safeguard it. It's uh, quite an adventurous thing, but I did make a interesting image on that particular moment. Finally, I would like to pay my respects to the legendary photographers of Bangalore, in particular the late C. Rajagopal, for inspiring uh, me into uh, the passion for photography, uh, uh, to, to make photography a part of our personalities. And uh, I think um, that was a very important uh, part of my photography that I was exposed to the legendary photographers of my city. Uh, interaction is important. Uh, you know, photography helps create bridges of understanding and respect. We have a lot of factors that divide people, that create uh, misunderstandings and disrespect. So photography is a very important tool that you can utilize to make us all human beings, to create humanity. And that is what I have done in Shutterbugs. I have had the privilege of interacting many personalities all over the world in photography. And I think that's wonderful to have photography as a passion. Of course, uh, from last season, I am the director for the portrait uh, uh, competition of the Photographic Society of America. It makes it more meaningful that my favorite subject has got a new meaning in conduct of this particular competition. I'm in the second season now. Um, the journey continues. Thank you and good light to you all. Arvind, I hope I've taken the correct time or did I overshoot? Uh, I'm very, very happy with the, the time that you've taken. I wish you'd take more time. Can you hear me? Uh, I don't know why my video is not popping up there. Okay, here it is. Sorry, there I am. Yeah. Am I okay there? Audible there? Uh, yes. Okay. I, 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 I have very... I'm at a loss uh, for words to appreciate what you've done in your life. And uh, I really think uh, your passion is showing through from your younger days till now. And I hope and pray that it will continue to guide and inspire many younger photographers. We're really very honored that you're here with us. And uh, we wish you all the very best. Uh, and I really am grateful. And please understand that... Uh, by having given a talk here, our association has begun and uh, TPS will always be there with you and we will all be there with you whenever you need anything over here. This is our uh, promise and uh, and absolutely, absolutely blown away by this. In fact, I was going to ask you whether we were going to be seeing any of your uh, fellowship uh, images until uh, you came to it in the end and very grateful for that too. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm hoping that uh, uh, you make a trip to India occasionally so whenever you Come, I'm hoping that you'll be able to come to Hyderabad sometime and we'll be our guest and uh, we would be happy to, happy, happy. if you can address TPS also. Yeah.
I would love to come to Hyderabad. I love Hyderabad. You never been to Hyderabad? No, I have been. I have been to Hyderabad. I did an assignment also on Hyderabad long time back during the slide days, and I ah. love Hyderabad. <laughs> Please come back. Please come back. You be a guest. You're always there with us. Uh, I'm so so grateful that you're here. I'm really blown by your work. And thank you, thank you so much. This is probably the most detailed and thorough explanation. You've been motivating people of uh, all standards of photographers in the society over here, and all the people who've been watching this. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, have you got any questions there? Uh, sir? Yeah. The chat is like filled with prayers for sir, and uh, there's a few questions as well. Uh, uh, sir, can I cut in here? Uh, if you want to, can you take a screenshot of the praise? Yes, sir, sure. And send it across to Ms. Asif, then he will probably be able to, along with the TPS, uh, on the TV screen, so he, it, it'll look more authentic for him because you know, when he opened the talk, he showed the letter with the APPS. Yes, sir. It, yeah, if you can do that, that'll also be nice. Thank you, sir. Go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry, sir. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, so, Scott Beckinsale, David has asked us, uh, do you prefer digital or analog? That's a fantastic question. Uh, actually, I prefer analog because one should understand that it's not only a matter of the result of in photography, it's not just the result, it's the process of photography which creates happiness and it is a joy and it is, it's something which we marvel at. How a picture is captured, taken and the way it is processed on a sea of chemicals. When you do the processing and uh, when you're printing your pictures, when you see the image coming out in a sea of chemicals as I call it, it's, it's a different kind of a feel. That feel is lost with the digital. And to complete my answer, I will say that in the digital age, there is the probability of abusing photography. So uh, there is less discipline that what you could have taken with one or two shots, you would have taken 10 shots. Uh, one is that the confidence level has decreased. The second is that you want to be an opportunist. So I think the other factors are predominating. The sense of the feeling of joy and happiness in creating a picture and making an image is being lost in the digital age. So I would always prefer to do analog uh, photography. It's a sheer joy of photography per se. Thank you, sir. Uh, I can personally say even I'm a very like, I'm a new photographer, but uh, I myself have recently purchased a film camera for the exact reason that you said. It's a completely That's different feeling. Uh, the photo crawler photography asks, hello, sir. I'm an amateur photographer. I really loved your talk and uh, how can I improve myself? Can you please repeat the question? Uh, the photo crawler photography is asking, uh, how they can improve themselves. I presume in photography. Okay, fair enough. Uh, one can improve oneself in photography in a very methodical approach. One has to have, see, photography starts with letter P and one should have patience. If you do not have patience, photography is not the genre that you have to pursue. All kinds of photography, whether it is wildlife photography, pictorial photography, the most important thing for a person to approach photography is not to be unorganized, it should be organized in a very methodical manner. First and foremost, I would recommend that you enhance your basic knowledge of the technicalities so that later on you will not be obsessed with the technicalities. First and foremost, have a good practice with focusing and with exposure metrics. Don't believe what you see in the internet, all the exposure triangles. I say it's humbug. There is nothing called exposure triangle. For me, it is a rectangle. In the exposure triangle approach, you have like ISO, you which is called auntie in Shutterbugs for your information. <laughs> you have aperture, which is called mother in Shutterbugs and you have shutter speed, which is called father in Shutterbugs. But everyone forgets the car. The car is the lens, the focal length. In the exposure triangle, there is no inclusion of the focal length because what happens is, this is I've seen practically, that as you change the focal length, the complete exposure matrix changes. So please, what I would say is go methodically, First, understand, I'm not saying master, first try to understand the exposure metrics and focusing. 
once you have got a good sound knowledge and control over this then you gradually go to different subjects like a thali you know the thali food you get uh, assortment of uh, side dishes right 9 10 side dishes as such i would always recommend that you try it out so in a thali what we do we try out the different side dishes and once we like a particular side dish we call the waiter up and say we want more of this if it is unlimited if it's limited you will not get anything so in photography you also do the same thing and my advice to you is first the basics try to do this at home itself try to take some curios at home understand focusing and exposure and then gradually go out with a thali approach that means try some nature some macro some portraits some landscapes some night shots some architecture some culture sports and then whichever meets your personality what you like then try to focus on that concentrate on that study it and with practice you will become a good quality photographer and it's a matter of time but you need to keep the momentum you should not have you know uh, what you call you should not be stopping photography anytime you should keep on the momentum and you will get a hold of it wow uh, thank you sir uh, i think that should have answered your question the photo crawler photography uh, the next question is from mr venu gopal bsnl uh, he asks uh, why are random shots not getting as much recognition as arranged shot shots uh are the salons and judges preferring quality than the elements in the photos taken naturally good it's a very good question uh, sometimes uh, the people who are uh, critiquing images or judging images um they are quite stereotypical what has been done in grandfather age time they continue with it we need to innovate we need to broaden our perspective it's not only what organized or staged shots that should be always applauded there is as i think he means random is candid shots yeah uh, more of environmental shots when you are you are touring or you know going on a trip you meet some kind of a subject or you want to take a picture even those pictures should be given importance because that is also photography it is more natural actually in fact the stage shots and with lot of uh, you know model arrangements and a uh, lot of work on digital uh, platforms Uh, looks more of artificial thing the, the actual essence of photography is lost so i agree with mr venu gopal uh, you said from photographic society of uh, madras psm no no it's uh, venu gopal bsnl he's from telangana photography uh, bsnl sorry okay bsnl bsnl okay okay i heard as psm sorry uh, mr venu gopal i agree with you that every genre every style of photography should be given its space we should not get hooked on to one particular stereotypical kind of photography that is actually not broadening our vision and it is it will stagnate photography we need to be open to new modern concepts and new thinking freshness of approach why not this should be the approach of those who do the critical analysis as well as those who judge salons and yeah i think that's it for the questions there's like the entire chat is filled with praise for you people are in like people are very uh they love your pictures and they love your explanation uh yeah th- thank you so thank you so much over to arvin sir thank you sir thank you so much and uh, this is also my thanks once again to you for this wonderful evening and we are very grateful to you for this and um, like i said you are always a guest here you are always welcome here and uh, when we say these things you will totally mean it so please do come by and uh, we look forward to interacting with you in person you will know that a lot of you so and i know i'm hoping that uh, uh, tps will also be able to collaborate in some way or the other with uh, the shutterbug and uh, your photographers in dubai and if you feel that we can do something we'll be more than happy to lend a hand and put our shoulder to that thing and push it through and uh, along with me i know that there are other societies within india who are all very keen photographers who are also members now of uh, tps who, from uh, from chennai and from bangalore would also be very interested in i know that there is a um, you know whenever something good happens in photography they all get together and i know that we will all get together so so the sole purpose so looking forward to meeting up with you sir and i hope everybody has enjoyed your talk as much as i have thank you very much once again sir and we should thank you arvin thank you very much it was a pleasure to be at the telangana photographic society platform and to interact with you thank you and, uh, it, um, 
computer Sorry. IT professional who coordinated the event. Sorry. Sorry. Thank, you very much. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, all. Good night. Yeah. So, so we can log off. Recording stopped.